Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to see so many people here in person. And uh, just so that you know, there are over 300 people online as well. So no <laughs> Before I can introduce this evening's speaker, a few protocols that will, I hope, help the online element of this event run smoothly. I do say these words at the beginning of every single friend. <laughs> Yeah, well, John wrote them, so yeah, I might like that we could say them. Throughout the talk, the Q&A feature is available. It looks like two speech bubbles, one on top of the other, into which you can type questions for the speaker. Only you and the speaker and the host can see these. After the lecture finishes, I will read out a selection of questions received online and in the room, and our speaker hopefully will respond. You should see a small window in the top right-hand side of your screen. If this gets in your way, you can mouse over it and even move it around your screen, or you can click on the bars above it to make it smaller. I will repeat the Q&A protocol at the end of the actual lecture. Now, I don't think very many people in this room or very many people online need to be introduced to John Bennett. John is a professor of Aegean Archaeology at the University of Sheffield. He taught at the universities of Wisconsin-Madison in the USA between 1986 and 1998, and he was at Oxford from 1998 to 2004, before taking up his current chair. As most of you will know, from 2015 to 2022, he was director of the British School at Athens. John's research interests lie in the combination of material and textual data in understanding the past. He's published on Late Bronze Age Crete and mainland Greece, on Linear B and on Historical Greece. And he's participated in or directed fieldwork on Crete, Panossos. He's carried out fieldwork also in Vestos and Hania regions of Crete, in the Pylos region on the mainland of Greece, and on the islands of Chaos and Kithra. He has written and edited many volumes, contributed to numerous other volumes, and written several articles. We are lucky enough to have him give this lecture, entitled, Never the Twain Shall Meet, Reflections on Text and Image in Minoan Crete, as it is like a partial preview of his book project, which is called A Short History of the Minoans, and is to be published by Bloomsbury. John. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Mary Christine, for that uh, extremely generous uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming here this evening and also to the number of people I gather who are uh, online. Um, it's good to know that uh, those sort of fraught moments, just as you start a Zoom uh, session, are still just as fraught as they were um, about three years ago, when we, four years ago, I suppose, when we started, started doing all of this. Um, my association with the BSA goes back many years, uh, and as you know, most, uh, most recently as director. Um, the BSA generates huge affection and loyalty, and I'm very pleased and proud to be a part uh, of the ever-expanding community of scholars and supporters. The friends of the BSA have done an enormous amount to support it over the last 35 years, organizing lectures, study tours, and raising significant funds. Most recently, for example, the Friends donated 6,000 to fund the acquisition of 91 volumes of the classical studies packages from Franz Steiner, a really superb edition for the library. Many of you will know that the BSA is a registered charity. We receive a grant through the British Academy, but nearly half of our annual operating funds must be generated from donations, legacies, grants, fees, uh, and investments. Ensuring the BSA can maintain its historic buildings in Athens and Kosovo and enhance and expand their academic mission is an ongoing challenge. With the BSA's program of lectures, we've always encouraged uh, attendees to make a small donation. Uh, so I hope, I hope you enjoy this evening's lecture, whatever, um, uh, but also that you will make a small donation to help the friends of the DSA. So for us in the modern Western world, writing seems terribly important. Yet we take it largely for granted. We are surrounded by text and image almost everywhere we go, as this image of Piccadilly Circus at night suggests. 
those objects that survive from the ancient world also speak to us. Those objects that have writing on them speak to us in a way that other categories of find do not. But our emphasis on the importance of writing seems to me to involve three unproven assumptions. First of all, that writing is a goal to which all societies aspire, you might call a teleological argument. That writing is an essential attribute of complex societies, a functional argument. And that writing is the same wherever it appears. It's a practice uh, to be discovered rather than one that evolves or is created in particular historical circumstances, you might call a universalist argument. I'd like to argue this evening that, at the very least, the ways in which writing was employed are not universal, uh, and that its use in my own Crete, and in particular its relationship with its cousin images, differed from our own familiarity and from practice in other arguably similar societies. In short, I'd like to argue that the Minoan past is indeed a foreign country. So I'm going to start with that sort of premise, um, then go on to examine uh, a paradox really in the Neopalatian period, a very, very rich visual world, but one in which writing and image are polar opposites. Then take a look at writing, Benel and his history on Crete, um, the emergence, appearance of the palaces, and I'm going to use the word palaces, I, I, I know it's quite fraught, but I'll use it for simplicity's sake. Uh, the palace and its association was monumental at the time. And then uh, the, how being there, how the power of performance uh, is important uh, in that, really that gap between writing uh, and the material world. And then in a small coda, look at final, final palatial Crete and also the Greek mainland. So I start with the paradox. Um, in the Neopalatial period on Crete, roughly, say, 1700 to 1450 BC, writing and image never share the same field of representation as reflected in these two objects. Either objects display writing or they display images, but never both. Yet this period is one which many of us are most familiar with and is enormously rich visually. In addition to gold signets, like we just saw, uh, and even more numerous seal stones, there's an extensive range of objects like those presented on this slide. Many of these could be described as small scale, even miniature, especially the signets and seals, unable to communicate their effect over any distance. The major innovation in the Neapolitan period is the appearance, quite suddenly, of wall decorations in the form of frescoes, many of them depicting fig figures at life size. Some clearly invited shared activity between those on the wall and those within the space itself, following a corridor, climbing a stair, while others could be taken in at a single glance, depicting scenes of action, probably narrative. The former I've termed participatory, the latter panoptic. And as Claire Pavivu has shown from the heavenly minoanized depictions on Thera, the two sometimes <laughs> combine within the same space. It's striking, however, that not one of these representations is enriched, fixed, or made more specific by the addition of writing. They too respect the polar opposition of text and images seen across all visual media in the Neapolitan period. Why should this be so? But to begin to understand the apparent paradox, I think we need to go back to the beginning of the origins of writing from Crete. The earliest writing known in the Aegean appeared on Crete uh, around 2000 BC. It's the so-called Afan script. The Cretan hieroglyphic script, script is then in use down to about 1600, 1500 BC. And within this same period, the Linear A script comes into use and continues in use to around 1450 BC. And finally, the only deciphered Aegean script, Linear B, the recorded in early form of Greek, comes into use around about 1400 BC and appears to go out of use entirely with the collapse of the Bronze Age palaces in the Aegean around 1200. Writing is fundamentally a material practice. It involves a surface onto or into which text is applied or inscribed in what is arguably a single episode of writing. So an object uh, onto which writing is applied has an existence in space and time as well as an association with other artifacts inscribed or otherwise. 
The stuff that is encoded in the material marks, however, the text, although fixed on or in the object, may not refer to the time or place of writing. It may refer to a place that is distant. It may refer to a time in the past. It may refer to a time in the future, which by definition does not exist or it may refer to an imaginary or fictitious time or place. Crucial to the operation of writing is that there's an agreed system by which the signs refer to specific elements of speech. When I say speech and gloss over here other potential systematic, systemic uh, signifying systems like music or algebra in order to draw a distinction with images, also representational, but rarely encoded systematically with specific meaning. Writing also requires a reading by someone familiar with the code, human or supernatural. The two different communities, the writing community and the reading community, need not be exactly coterminous, but their combined size effectively defines the extent of literacy within a society. Reading, of course, is a visual art. It can take place multiple times, and it can be displaced in both time, even millennia after the original act of writing, where translation or decipherment is involved, and in space. One does not need to participate in the writing or reading process itself to understand that it is going on. It's enough to observe either in action, to be aware of a process of materialization of thought or speech, or its opposite, its dematerialization in the form of an oral rendition of written text. That's enough for sort of theoretical aspects. <clears throat> now, writing has a beginning in at least two places in the world, Mesopotamia and Egypt. And given the way that writing came into being in those two places, a simple question is, did the people at the time know they were writing? <laughs> Clearly not, because writing did not exist as a definable, distinct material practice. In the case of the Sumerians, they were engaging largely in recording practices involving number, also bringing in iconography for the contemporary scenes. In the case of the Egyptians, if we take an example of the tokens and other objects found in the well-known tomb UJ at Abydos, they were similarly involved in recording practices, but not doing anything that we would recognize as writing. It took centuries for anything resembling our understanding of writing to develop in these regions. By contrast, when writing appears in the Aegean, it emerges quite suddenly through encounters with a practice already well formed over a millennium in the Eastern Mediterranean and Mesopotamia. It comes in, most scholars agree, in a period towards the end of the third millennium BC, when use of the sail as a technology had effectively collapsed the distance between the Aegean and communities in the Eastern Mediterranean. It also accompanied, it's also accompanied by a series of other elite practices and materials, stone vessels, ivory, and scarab seals, among others. However, writing in the Aegean is structurally and formally distinct from the major systems of the Eastern Mediterranean. It does not take on the form of cuneiform, but structurally it is a simple syllabary, unlike the logosyllabic Akkadian or Egyptian. Writing in Aegean also makes use of ideograms. The sealing practice in the Aegean, well established by this period, made use of stamping, not rolling, which was the typical of cylinder seals used in the East Mediterranean and Mesopotamian world. It's very likely, given the difficulties of navigating north from Egypt, that relations were established with sites in the eastern Mediterranean, Bidlos being, Bidlos being a good candidate, as Andy Bevan noted some time ago, in relation to their shared uh, similar stone vessel repertoires. It may therefore be no accident that at about this time there was a Slavic script at Bidlos, so far undeciphered at least four times, so effectively undeciphered. <laughs> This earliest recognized writing of Crete is conventionally called the Arhanis script after the location where some examples were found. A context that dates to the early middle Minoan 1a period, although the chronology is not absolutely secure, strictly a period that by convention we would characterize as pre palatial, i.e., before the construction on Crete of the architectural complexes conventionally known as palaces, so arguably not tied to the emergence of complex society. The Arhana script is only found uh, on seals, not inscribed, and so far not in impressions on clay. This fact creates a taphonomic issue. Is it that we simply have not yet uncovered the burnt context in which the clay into which these seals were stamped would have been fired? The existence of a small number of sealings, i.e. 
ones that had been baked in earlier contexts, early Minoan two to three from the mid third millennium BC, implies that uh, such Messenians might have been found had the Alcanian script seems been used in that way. It is, however, possible that the creation of the seals themselves and the application of symbols that we associate with writing were part of that set of elite practices adopted at the time, and that the use of seals as objects to make marks in clay was either not important or was a secondary use for these prestigious objects. And two aren't, of course, actually exclusive. The other important feature of this earliest writing uh, in Aegean um, and here I'm referring to work by people like uh, Margaret Jassing, Sylvia Ferrara, Maria Stanislaviadou, and Roland de Porte. The important, another important feature is it presents ambiguities to us today, right? Many objects are marked with signs that scholars agree are elements of a writing system because they appear as such in the slightly later Cretan hieroglyphic script. And here we might think again of some of the tokens uh, on the Abydos tomb in Egypt. But these signs are accompanied by more seemingly pictorial signs, sometimes at different scales. Are these signs merely iconographic, or do they somehow connote meaning within a communication system? This issue was explored recently by several scholars, scholars including Roland de Port, who gave us some continuity of motifs, like the grid network here on the third millennium seal from one of the Aya Triathlon students on the right. Um, and on a protopalatial Cretan hieroglyphic seal from Knossos uh, on the left. One could then argue that the Cretan hieroglyphic script proper crystallized as a set of symbols from a much larger, less rigorously systematic repertoire of images in use over several centuries. And a potential catalyst for the transition to a writing system is the appearance of Egyptian scarab seals in the middle Minoan 1A period as Julia Fuda has suggested, further emphasizing the importance of the suffragistic milieu. Another argument for the primacy of the glyptic or suffragistic use of writing is the apparent priority of glyptic forms of signs. <clears throat> for example, where the drill is applied to the end of strokes to realize a dot on glyptic examples, but this same feature is applied by punching the stylus uh, on, into the clay, and the script is inclined, inscribed on clay. That's this particular sign that you see there. At the very least, the direction of copying such signs would be likely from elliptic to inscribed rather than vice versa. Another potential link between script and sealing practice is the possibility, suggested by Silvia Ferrara and Diego Cristiani, that the Cretan hieroglyphic <coughs> sign, which we know uh, affectionately as 044, rather than representing a trowel, as Evans uh, argued, may in fact represent the pet shaft, a distinct form of seal in the protocolation period, pre and protocolation period, sorry. A further intriguing feature of Cretan hieroglyphic script usage that further reflects strong links to the sphragistic world is the possibility of creating an inscription by stamping. As we see on this example of a so-called crescent or nodule in French, uh, from the Knossos hieroglyphic deposit that bears two Cretan hieroglyphic seal impressions that you see at the top, um, uh, and also the same string, the same string signs, is inscribed uh, with a stylus on the object itself. The logical follow-on, of course, of producing text by stamping, one could argue, is typing, and that's just what we have on the Festos disk. And most people who work in the Gene script don't like to talk about the Festos disk, so <laughs> About the same time as the first appearance of writing, we observe the monumentalization of what were conventionally called palaces, often now termed court centered buildings, places of history in distinct locations within the landscape, augmented by the accumulation of human debris into the form of tales, as well as places for gathering and for performance. And one can argue that the palace is a frame which embodies a monumental time, a time that is static and bound up with the places in which people congregated, as Karyan argued some years ago. In the protopalatial period, representational art is predominantly small scale, even miniature, continuing prepalatial practice. Seals were tiny, some less than a centimeter across, most less than three centimeters. So we're talking about things this size. And these objects required close proximity to be read, either as objects or as impressions. 
in the pre palatial period, structures like the Mesoartum complexes in the third millennium or the palaces in the second millennium, it was, it was these that dominated the world of large scale human creations. One can argue that the palaces were situated within pre spectacular landscape, uh, mimicking the surrounding mountains, as Friesen has argued. Tellingly, they were aligned on key features like Yuftas, south of Knossos, that you see on the left, or the Edean Massif, containing the Kamara's cave, north of Festas on the right. Given Mount Ida's twin peaks appearance from Festos here, I favor the idea that the so-called halls of consecration uh, were a symbolic horizon rather than stylized bullet points. But these significantly situated special places like the Kamara's Cave or Deep Top Sanctuaries, places also of gathering, seem to tie the palaces to the landscape, further emphasizing their scale and their permanence in monumental time. By the Neapolitan period, several changes are afoot. The interior spaces of the palaces are elaborated and choreographed by the addition of figured wall paintings, as noted already, a new art form functioning at a large scale. Since activity of peak type sanctuaries declines in this period, one wonders if the elaboration of palace walls was related to a greater flow of people within their spaces. A particular form of fresco decoration, characteristic of the highest quality of production on Crete, is the relief fresco, in which one could say that the beings depicted are embodied within the walls, anchored within the very structure of the palace itself. These large scale fresco depictions choreograph people's actions or movements within the architectural space of the palaces, facilitating a participatory interaction, as I noted earlier. It may also be significant that some of the panoptic, the smaller frescoes in the palace, depict the kinds of gatherings drawn into the palace complexes. The so called sacred grove fresco on the left, which clearly shows the west court of Knossos with masses of people surrounding a ceremony involving dance, uh, or the grandstand fresco, uh, which again on the right depicts uh, a large group of people supposed to be within the central court uh, at Knossos itself. And the other depictions might be the depictions of bull weaving, for example. What is not found in either context, participatory or panoptic, in, but a particularly striking absence in the case of the panoptic scenes is text in the form of labels or captions to help particularize or to fix the narrative implicit in the representations. There's no way of knowing what an, any particular scene depicts, certainly not for us, uh, unless one is in the know, or unless someone explains it in the form of a parallel oral narrative. By the late Bronze Age, we may, we've moved away from the situation that pertained with Greek hieroglyphic seals, as on the left, where text and image seem to occupy the same plane, and text could be generated repeatedly by impression, to a situation where either text or image are represented in the centre, but the two are never combined, either on a small or large scale. Moreover, written text is now only generated in the moment, it's inscribed, not multiple times by impression, and seals are used in parallel with text, as perhaps more strikingly in the characteristic form of the Mano Randall that you see uh, on the right, where an inscribed text is on the face uh, and you have multiple seal impressions around the outside. Writing and sealing have come, become performances requiring live actors. Now, the presence of large scale representations and of writing raises the question of why, in the Aegean, we now have scenes uh, like these the famous Steely of Naram Sin uh, uh, on the top left in the middle, uh, or examples in many other cultures like the Maya, are uh, also seen here, that combine writing with image where one complements the other. In the Aegean, it seems that possibility is deliberately withheld. So we're in a situation where writing is associated with monumental spaces, the palaces, and writing itself as a material practice on objects is lasting, material, and visual. And it's also esoteric, and is only created by inscription or incision, not by stamping a pre-composed text using a seal. And this contrasts with something I'm calling text, essentially oral text, which is by nature ephemeral, immaterial, oral, performative, and human and of course immediately accessible and immediately lost. 
Yet, and here we have the paradox, in the absence of writing on a monumental scale, it's only possible for rituals of power to be enacted in person, as performances requiring the presence of key actors, rulers, bull leaders, dancers, etc. Paraphrase Ellen Davis, the ruler is not missing, but would have been, would have been present in person, acting in accordance with depictions on palace walls and using portable equipment brought in to activate a particular space. Unlike the third person iconography of other cultures, this represents a first person iconography of power, depending on the individual actually being there. And similarly, interaction between the sphere of written administration within the monumental space of the palace and the human world only now happens orally and in person. We can see this perhaps most clearly uh, in the Knossos throne room with the caveat that, as Yanis Galanakis and others have recently reminded us, its preserved form strictly belongs to the final palatial period, not to the neopalatial, although it's quite likely that the complex was arranged in a similar fashion in that period. Here, the placement of griffins, heraldically flanking both the inner entrance, which you see on the left, uh, and in inner entrance to the room and a throne, inverted commas, itself. The structure is the movement and performance. In the subsequent positions, the scene is only completed by the physical presence of a human actor seated on the throne. The total composition effectively becomes a relief image, like the relief frescoes also attested at Knossos, in which a two dimensional wall painting becomes a two and a half dimensional relief image when the human actor is actually in place. And equally, if we take a Persian semiotic view of such scenes, then they combine the iconic representations of griffins, because yes, images too can text to can refer to the unreal. The symbolic, the power implied by the combination of feline and avian raptor features in the griffins, and the indexical, as griffins are shown, when, when griffins are shown elsewhere in the gene iconography, they're clearly large in comparison to humans, as you see in the two examples on the right, one from Zesti, uh, Zesti Thera, uh, Thera and one from Avafio Seal. These elements are only active, however, when the composition is complete with the human actor in place. The same complex of performance, gatherings, spaces, which are choreographed and esoteric knowledge is appropriated with full knowledge and understanding into the Mycenaean mainland world from late Hellenic I onwards. The Knossos throne room, for example, seems is echoed at least a century later in, in the main Megaron of six of Pylos. Large scale scenes are rare in non participatory compositions, it's not in frescoes. The only monumental example that comes to mind is the 13th century BC Lion Gate at Mycenae. Compositions like the Lion Gate can, however, be rendered in legible form, even at small scale, in clearly arranged heraldic scenes, such as those depicted on scene stones, which you see on the right, um, or, or their impressions on clay. Examples include those mimicking the Lion Gate or similar large-scale compositions comprising two beings around the central feature. As has been made vividly clear by finds from the Griffin Warrior II Papyrus, the possibility also exists of creating extraordinary complex scenes in miniature, such as that of the so-called combat agate that you see in the lower left here, reckoned to be a minor product of the neopalatial period. The scene can only be fully appreciated by us under a modern high-powered lens, while in its time, an object like this could only be appreciated at very close quarters, and presumably by a tiny group of individuals. Seems like these two are therefore esoteric, and perhaps remind us of the esoteric art circulating in elite circles under the Roman Emperor Augustus, the Gemma Augustea, for example. And as Stocker and Davis have argued, the collection of objects yeah. like the combat agate implies a knowledge or an understanding, sort of connoisseurship, of the esoteric content of the imagery on such minor objects. And they point out the similarity between the scepter that you see on the left, uh, scepter head found in the Griffin Warrior's tomb, and that depicted in the hand of one of the arguably divine figures on one of the signets at the very top there. Within Linear B scribal practice, it's possible to combine text and image in examples such as Knossos SD chariot tablets, examples seen here, uh, where you see 
The word written uh, in syllabic signs, equally are in the case of the chariot tablet, uh, and also depicted on the far right uh, in a lediogram. And similarly, uh, in the example on the right, we have the word kararewe, which is clearly the Muslim word for stirrup jars, which are depicted immediately adjacent uh, to it uh, on the tablet. And also the word for cloths, parwaya, which you see at the bottom left, on the left, uh, where the object is depicted using ideograms that, that represent it visually, as well as the, the written text. So within the esoteric world of writing, captioning is permitted. Now this esoteric world, associated with the monumental time of the palaces, encounters human time on various occasions, but only selectively. So for example, the B text, dealing with the whole process of woolen textile production, might be prolific, but they're focused only on certain parts of that process, often those parts where there's a change of status. And by definition, this involves engaging with people and requires an interaction between people and the literate administrators who belong to the monumental frame of the palace. And that interaction is often highlighted, often mediated through the non or semi literate practice of sealing highlighting the long continuity of this practice from the time before writing until its disappearance. But note that here, unlike in the Cretan hieroglyphic situation, text is now added to the seal impression by inscription. It can only be activated by the participation of a literate scribe. So returning to our starting point, how do our questionable assumptions stand up? Well, for number one, uh, I would argue that the Manoan Mycenaean case suggests that writing was not a practice to which these societies aspire. Had they done so, they would more likely have adopted a writing system and administrative practices that already, already existed in the Eastern Mediterranean. Rather, a writing system evolved from a different source, inspired by pre-existing models. Although it expanded in its use and freed itself from the medium of seals, it never escaped a narrow public circle. Secondly, was writing essential to the development of complex society on Crete? At the very least, least we have to say that it, it, it emerged before what we conventionally call palaces uh, conventionally uh, appeared in the middle of the 1A period, which was still <coughs> pre uh, in most traditional chronologies. However, many would argue that Crete was already well on the way to complexity before that. So we might rather argue that writing evolved alongside complexity, a symptom rather than a cause. And finally, was the writing that did emerge recognizably like, like writing as it's known elsewhere or now? I'd say not. It was appropriated within a set of established practices, such as stamp sealing around the turn of the third and second millennia BC, and it was then embedded in a set of elite practices such as the monumentalization of open space in the true or first palaces, by which I mean Knossos, Festos, and probably Malia. These palaces created a monumental time, static and unchangeable, embedded within their landscapes. Interaction with these monumental spaces was choreographed very carefully for those who entered them, and access was controlled to esoteric knowledge, materials, practices, etc., including writing. The existence of and practice of writing were, however, revealed through sealing practices and through the ability to observe writing and reading taking place without necessarily participating or engaging in it. So the monumental time of the palace engaged human and natural time selectively through practices, including sealing. However, the perpetuation of power structures did not depend on writing, but by the Neapolitan period, used the frame of the palace as a performative space made specific and activated by the presence of key actors. And here, certainly by the Mycenaean period, oral performance was crucial and writing played, writing played no part. With the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces, that frame was removed and the link between monumental and human, literate and illiterate dissolved. And ironically, from here on, for several centuries, it is oral performance that persists into the first millennium BC. But that's another story. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It's really very, very interesting. Um, I'm now going to throw the floor over to questions. If there's anybody in the room who would like to ask a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to 
that to ask a good question, and I guess that's all right. Um, is there any other society which deliberately excludes writing from or keeps separate writing from pictures and or doesn't put informative hieroglyphs on their pictures? Well, I think you could say that, um, I mean, first of all, I think we have to predicate it with the fact that in most non non modern non Western societies, like what we're talking about, writing is a very restricted practice mm -hmm. anyway. So there aren't very many people who can do it. Um, but I mean, there are many examples um, in, in the modern world and so on where images are used but without the sort of specificity of the writing being applied to the image. Uh, although it's not excluded. I mean, what strikes me about I know Queens is that it's, it, it, it never happens. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are examples of inscriptions on frescoes, but they're nothing to do there. At least some of them seem to be incised and they seem to be um, administrative. Yeah. Um, and uh, and there, there are very, very few of those. Uh, so I think it's that sort of it, it, that big conclusion that, that it's, um, it's peculiar. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I must say that I forgot to reiterate the protocol after asking questions. So there are two speech bubbles, one's on top of the other, into which you can type your questions, not in the room, obviously. Um, and only, only you, the speaker, and the host can see these. You should see a small window on the top right of your screen. That gets in your way, as I've said before, you can remove it. But uh, do type your questions if you are interested yeah. in asking the question. Sorry, Paul. John, yeah. you said that until Linear B, none of the early forms of writing had been understood. And, and you haven't said very much about the symbols that we, we use. Um, I, I'm fascinated to think what these symbols might have actually represented by way of writing, but were, were, were they named for the writing? Is it, um, it's not, I don't know what they're doing. The same, the same signs, the same rules repeatedly sort of So, um, so um, the, the bench had understood, um, because I think we do understand both Greek and Hieroglyphic and Linear A quite well. What we can't do is read them and translate them, so so they haven't been deciphered in, in the same way that the new B has. Um, the if we go backwards from the new B to the new A, there's a, a fantastic book that you sure should read by Esther Salgadeva, in which she demonstrates very convincingly, to my view, that the new B is essentially, if you can have such a thing, a scribal dialect of the new A, and so those scripts are effectively the same script. Um, it's a bit like, uh, I suppose, um, English and Turkish, where we both use the alphabet, but we have slightly different values for some of the, the letters we use. Um, Greek and hieroglyphic, the shared sign groups, the shared signs between that and linear A suggest that they are uh, quite closely related. And structurally, all three operate the same way. They're syllabic scripts. They have you know something like 80 or 90 okay. uh, symbols, but they have a quite a range of ideograms. So we do understand quite a lot about them. And, and you know, we can we can we can do quite a lot. We can show that there's a, a tablet from the new from uh, Aetriana, for example, which deals with uh, units of wine. But what we don't know is whether it's wine coming in or going out, who the people it's going to, or the, the uh, authorities it's going to, the places it's going to, or coming from, and so on, because we haven't uh, we haven't deciphered the script. So thanks for picking up the Thanks very much, Dr. It was splendid. Could it, after all you mentioned well, English and Turkish, it suddenly made me think because, of course, before Ataturk, the Turks used the, the Arabic script. Is, right. is there a, a, a similar thing that we could hope for um, with, with linear B, linear A? Was there a, you know, are they deliberately trying to affiliate themselves? Um, oh, undoubtedly, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you see that you see that both. In, I mean, read Esther's book, yeah, um, because it's a, one of the few. Give me uh, perhaps I'm overstating this, but anyway, it's, it's among the few linguistic books which actually takes account in a serious way of the historical context. So that's what I think is one of the great strengths of 
of her, her work. And she makes exactly those points about why you'd want to um, adapt a perfectly good existing script to, to, to a different language. But you also see it, as Galanakis and others argued, in the, this Knossos throne, which draws on elements of, of Manon tradition and combines them with what are considered to be main tradition. So you have this sort of hybrid culture, material culture, but also um, a script which is essentially not exactly a hybrid script, but is adapted to, to Greek, which it must have become a prestige language, whether you believe the Mycenaeans came in conquered Greek or it was some other more nuanced pro uh, process. Um, uh, I think I lost my thread there anyway, but it must forget the point. <clears throat> just before I take one from the floor, I'm just going to take one from the web. Dear John, many thanks for an inspiring talk. Do you think that the lack of writing on images and frescoes is somehow related to the lack of ruler iconography, unlike the East Mediterranean imperial states, where you have both ruler iconography and texts? I think, uh, yes, I mean, short answer, yes. Younger answer, going the other way around, I think you don't have ruler iconography because you don't have the association of text and image that would produce it. But I hope I kind of, Argued in your paper that the form, form that ruler iconography took yeah. was a live performance, performative kind of iconography. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the ruler was missing, the ruler was only there on certain occasions in person, as opposed to being depicted forever on a wall or steely or whatever. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, John, thank you. Fascinating. Um, actually, what you were saying at the beginning about the place of writing in these civilizations it reminded me of an article I read in the FT Weekend this week by Janan Ganesh. I don't know if anyone else wrote it, where he talks about uh, well, his take on um, contemporary art forms is that um, art, like pictorial art and music, he says as well, are superior to literature, to writing. Um, and it's interesting you going, you know millennia before to talk about the place of writing and apparently how it was sort of valued in these societies. Um, anyway, I, it's an interesting article and I often agree with him. I'm not sure I do on this occasion. But, um, <laughs> my question was, um, I mean, if, I've, if I understood the lecture right, um, that writing, at least in um, the ancient Minoan civilization and Greek emerges out of um, the use of rudimentary writing for recording purposes, right? essentially sort of clerical purposes. Um, where do we see the earliest example of a creative element or imagination coming into uh, writing, not in that civilization, but what develops out of it? Very earliest examples we have of that. Okay, yeah. probably didn't do my job well enough <laughs> because I think I would argue that writing when it first appeared in the Gene of Crete is actually not just about mm -hmm. recording, unlike the Sumerian example. Right. And in fact, there are some parallels between the Sumerian example <laughs> because what the Sumerian example does is that first of all, it starts off by pressing the feelings into play. Mm. Um, in exactly the number of things that you have. And then realize that actually, if you have things like tens and hundreds and so on, you actually don't need to write all of that. You, mm -hmm. actually, you get the idea of sort of concept of, of, um, sort of um, uh, concept of number. <clears throat> but how do you record a temple or someone? Mm -hmm. You need to have sound, you need to be able to express their name. And they seem to borrow that iconography by the Rebus principle. So if it's Mr. Bear, uh, you draw a bear, or it's mm. just a bear, or if it's a cat, you draw mm. a cat, and so on. And then you combine that with this, this numerical system. So that's, in a nutshell, um, how writing emerges in, in, in the Sumerian world. Um, it's more complex, but, uh, but somewhat similar at the very earliest bit in Egypt. Now, um, quite quickly in Crete, because this is <coughs> a borrowing rather than a strict development, or an inspiration, you would say, um, they obviously do start using it for all the things that we talk about, sort of um, uh, for uh, accounting and mm -hmm. so on. And, and that's clear in, in Greek hieroglyphic tablets. I know some linear A tablets, there's lots of numbers on them, uh, and so on. But that's all behind the walls of the palace. Um, 
in terms of creativity, I, I've got one tiny little joke from, from Vinnie B. And that is, there's a Lily B sign for what? And there's a Lily B sign for dwarf. And it's two was put together. Mm. And that's clearly a joke in Greek. The or the or. Mm. Dwarf put together. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think that, I mean, and of course, the, the, in fact, again, Esther Sabirella is a rather interesting article which she had in the Risk of Athens. Used to say a couple of years ago, in which she's arguing the way in which some signs come into being, and that that was definitely a, a creative process in, right. in the so kind of way you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's been because of the nature of the Greek hieroglyphic script, which looks and looked to Evans, and of course that was one of the barriers to Evans' understanding things. He was a bit pig-headed. Um, <laughs> it looked very Victorian, so people have done a lot of work on looking at the, the, the Victoriality. But I think. Well, a few people, I mean, uh, Artemis Carnaval, but also, as I say, Esther in this, this article, have sort of probed that a little more systematically and a little more scholarly. But the, the, the precise kind of things I think we're talking about are, are happening there. Yeah. I think I've leapt ahead a bit too much. And while I'm thinking of what the kind of um, not creativity about the development of the, of the, oh. the, um, of the script. But about the thoughts expressed in okay, the script. Yeah. 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 Um, well, we're it's a blank book for us in right. relation to yeah. everything that survives is, is on a material medium that would be preserved. So mm -hmm. burnt clay, um, stone, metal, etc. And then the tantalizing thing is from Neoplasian Creek, we have a bunch of very small ceilings, mm -hmm. clay ceilings, which on the underside you can see little folded packages of parchment, mm -hmm. which clearly have no touch. And they're sealed, so you can't open yeah. without breaking the seal, which so it's a, it's a document. But we don't know what they're saying because parchment doesn't survive fires, unlike clay. So we don't know what they're writing there. Very likely that it was tied to either commerce or diplomacy. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> because they they're, they're found uh, a theory and they were stamped by seals, which was still in use in Crete about 100 years after the theory eruption. Mm -hmm. And they reckon that the clay is not a theory of clay, it's Crete and clay. So these documents have traveled from mm -hmm. Crete to, to theory, and what they contain, we don't know. But um, there's very, I mean, Nick is supposed to get a very good book on Mesopotamian writing, in which he points out the sort of stages at which what we might think of as more interesting forms of writing come along, the counting or stuff like that, mm -hmm. letters, um, the writing down of legends and so on. When linear A, linear A, linear B were first discovered in the early 20th century, everyone was desperate to find the version of some proto homo that yeah. was written in linear B. But I think I would argue that it didn't exist because of that. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just going to take one from the web at the moment. What intrigues me is why Egyptian hieroglyphs developed or matured in inverted commas into a writing system used for monumental inscription. But the Minoan scripts did not. The Minoan influence in Egypt can be seen in the frescoes Manfred Bietak discovered at Avaris, yet there seems to be far less influence the other way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what, why didn't they do it? They, they, well, you, I suppose you, you can't prove this, but you could just about argue that connections in the proto relation period, so the period of about years and years of Egyptian, 2000 to 1700, let's say, were indirect. So your, your Manoan was dealing with someone from Egypt in somewhere like Ugarit or Biblos or something like that. And they'd never seen uh, an Egyptian full-size um, hieroglyphic. And that changed when the Neoplasian period came around and suddenly they started putting these frescoes all over the walls because they'd seen them in person. Yeah. And I didn't have time to chase it up, but the Egyptian tomb paintings depicting people from, from Kefu um, uh, on them uh, are just a little bit later than that. that. You can't say that they saw those tomb paintings and then started painting their walls, but, but uh, if you could make that argument, of course, it's it's unproven. Um, yeah. so. yeah. um, I've been trying to formulate my question because it's a bit confused here. Um, I was actually thinking about the way information is transmitted nowadays using emojis mm -hmm. and small images that people can read and they sort of understand what they mean. 
if that was, a, do we think maybe that it was a similar sort of use instead of writing in Creek? Okay, so interestingly enough, um, that's called ideography. And people are studying it now because much of what we see nowadays is not anything like pure phonetic writing. It's a mixture of, we actually don't read letters, we read words and shapes and so on, we phrases. But we also read other things, particularly when we're looking at things on the web. You know, we see images together. Um, the argument that Roland de Port uh, made in his PhD thesis, some of which is published in articles, is that that's precisely what we have going on uh, among the, I think it must be, well, certainly several hundred, possibly uh, several thousand seals that exist from the pre palatial period, seals, not sealings, that were found, uh, many of them found in these circular tombs in the Lesser Island. And they have both a sort of similar <coughs> set of, um, uh, of iconography, and it's sort of generically, or uh, well, you can talk about sort of a range of fairly generic forms which are elaborated, um, but um, they're all, all used slightly differently. And some of those, uh, like I was showing, the, the grid pattern seem to return in uh, seal impressions or seals where these script scholars erase the other stuff and they only focus on what they think of canonical science. But the court argues that these, um, these patterns that appear on the early seals and then reappear later did have some meaning. And that meaning might have been, for example, in Egyptian, you have to try and tell people exactly what category that word is you're talking about. It's a god, it's a human, it's a, a place, it's a, a whatever. They may have done something like that. Um, so there is still, I mean, Evans was trying to see meaning. He, Evans knew that the Greek hieroglyphic was a, was a script, a phonetic script, a, a script of representative language, but he still tried to use the symbols on the seals to argue that someone who had a trowel, as he thought it was, uh, was a mason because that was the scene we could have a trial with. Uh, and of course, his name might have been Mason, as it were. I know, which we knew. Um, uh, so uh, so that, that, that visual richness it, it, it is partly what's confusing us. Uh, and it's the same with Egyptian. When, when we think of you know, how late it was before Egyptian it deciphered, because everyone thought it came through the pictures or Apollo or something. And it was all about interpreting the pictures. And then, you know, it took Champollion and Young. Um, to uh, to to realise it was phonetic when they had the thing that we had in the end down the road. Right, a fairly general question: Are there any signs that other Mediterranean cultures adopted any aspects of the Minoan writing systems? Cyprus, Cyprus. Super Minoan is called Super Minoan. Mm. Sue Sherrod argues incorrectly mm. because it hasn't got much to do with that. Uh, um, it's used in a pretty different context, but, it, but it, 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 the sign repertoire clearly comes from the Okay. Is there anybody else in the room who wants to ask a question? Well, people are thinking, Evans, of course, determined that Phine the Phoenician alphabet also came from the Lyra, but we don't believe that anymore. Paul. Oh. You mentioned the combat package yeah. uh, discovered in the Griffin Mori tomb in the Peloponnese and Pete and Epilos. What did you just tell me to ask a little bit more about the interface between the Mycenaean civilization and the Minoan civilization? Um, at the time I visited this site some years ago, now about four years ago, they were they were subjecting the or submitting, not subjecting the body of the Griffin warrior for DNA testing to determine whether it was of Mycenaean or Minoan origin. I never heard the result of that examination. Perhaps they're still working on it. But the question really is, um, that structure you showed, the evolution of script in relation to Crete, could you lay that as a template over the Mycenaean civilization? Are they, are they pretty well parallel? What's going on? Well, I think um, what, I mean, so you start with Evans, who believed that the Minoans colonized the main, and that's everything that was great, came from Crete and it time prior to everything else. And then you come back to the sort of um, thought of the 70s and 80s in, in Aegean archaeology that everything was indigenous. Um, and, and by this time, you know, people like Wace and Lady had rejected the sort of idea of a simple minor colonization. 
what I think is now clear, and again, come back to Esther's book, I think it's so clear in the way that the, the, the two scripts are directly related, that there's long-term content uh, between the mainland from the time of the shaft raid. Right? So we're talking about probably one or two centuries before the sort of focal period where I was talking about the 15th century. Um, it's where they're, consume, they're appropriating, consuming, and, and, and using my known artifacts, as well as things like amber from the opposite direction, as it were. So you've got that period of a couple of centuries. And I mean, that's a long time to be in, in contact. And, and it's not, you know, they're not occasionally separating each other. They're, they're going back and forth across the Aegean. And so if we think of, you know, the natural state of people as generally not being monolingual, then I'm pretty sure that the people then I was nodding at the back and fighting for the weeks. Um, people, um, you know, people in the mainland speak my own because they have to. And people on Crete speak Crete because they have to. And what flips in the middle of the 15th century is that suddenly Greek becomes the language in which to do administration. But it's not, I mean, the, the, the idea that the, the Mycenaeans conquered and introduced uh, the script because they had to, because they were Greeks and they couldn't do anything else but speak Greek, use a Greek script. Um, it, it's just too too simple. And it, 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 it belies that length of content that must have happened. Is that what you're answer? Except the mystery of the DNA and the growth of one. The DNA, uh, well, the trouble is with one person, you don't find anything else about you. Um, it, it'll tell you what his DNA is, and as far as I know, it has been published. And it's a big long article with lots and lots of stuff, and it's you know, kind of like most of the DNA around the Indian at the time. Um, it's not, it doesn't say you'll never get a DNA sample which says this person came from Crete. You might be strontium on the teeth, mm -hmm. um, they may have come from another part of Greece or maybe from Crete. But it's quite rare to be that specific. You can often say it's something not local, but you can local. Strontium stays in the teeth from when you get your. your your adult teeth. And therefore, if you measure the strontium isotope ratio, you know where that person formed their, their adult teeth. But it's not very precise in that stage. DNA is, not, DNA is much more useful if you have cemeteries. Do everyone in the cemetery, and then you know whether it was sometimes grandfather and mother and aunt. And some of that's been done in this, I think the same article, isn't it? Where they different articles. Different articles. Good stage for security. Yeah, and then you've got some of um, yeah. some, some Egyptian style marriage and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, final questions. I wonder whether the separation in art and writing in Crete could be because the jobs of scribe and painter were very separate and required very different training. That brings up a question about the possibility of Egyptian stroke Near Eastern painters who were also literate. Well, I think if you, if you take the historical view, in the period in which you're inscribing seal stones with both Cretan hieroglyphic and um, one would say pictorial uh, signs, you, you've got that, that. Those two jobs are in the same um, workshop, as it were. They're producing seals. We have a workshop for money, we only have hundreds of these things, a few hundred of these things, anyway. Um, so I don't think it's that the jobs. The job separate. I think it's who, who's, who's controlling the show kind of separates the two um, media. Really. Okay. Well, thank you very much to John for a fascinating lecture and for answering so many questions. Thank you to everybody who's been online and thank you to all of you who are in the room. Thank you, John. It's been thank